Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here today and was truly honored to have the invitation to work with the Archives of American Art. Um, I sort of think that in a country that often doesn't um, give a lot of recognition to the arts, just the very fact of the Archives of American Art's existence is kind of a remarkable thing and that it's lasted for the over, um, almost or over 50 years now um, is just a, a great testament to, to their work and the importance of it. So um, I'd like to thank uh, Kate and Liza Kerwin and Mary Savig who invited me and helped organize the exhibition. Um, and of course the design team uh, which did such a wonderful job uh, making such a beautiful show. Um, so, as Jack said, for uh, starting in 2003, I began working uh, on the catalog resume, and it was sort of a remarkable project because we not only were the first people to have unfettered access to Motherwell's archive, but also the means to uh, travel around the country and um, go into archival collections here and in Europe. And uh, I think. I don't have the exact count, but just within the Archives of American Art, we um, looked into, I think, over 150 different archival collections, including um, original documents and oral history interviews by Motherwell and by uh, his colleagues or scholars who had worked on him. Um, And basically, uh, in the talk, I'm just going to run through some of the uh, objects in the show and um, have some just brief comments on them. Uh, so, let's see. It goes. Starting out, Motherwell um, was born in 1915, thus the centennial this year of his birth, and uh, moved to New York in. 1940 to attend Columbia University and quickly fell in with a circle of European artists and a few Americans. One of the first was, um, first American artists he knew was William Baziotis and this is a letter uh, from 1944 um, written from Amagansett uh, on Long Island in the Hamptons where Motherwell would move a year later. Um, and he's talking just about the kind of the exciting milieu that um, existed in, in the Hamptons at that time. The, um, oops, sorry, get the hang of this here. Um, you know, out in the Hamptons during that summer were uh, Jane Bowles, um, let's see, Pierre Charot, uh, Max Ernst and Peggy Guggenheim, uh, and Motherwell just sort of relating the events across the street from Motherwell was John Cage, who he had known since '41, but he was encouraging Baziotis to get to know uh, to get to know Cage, um, and uh, sort of reflecting. Motherwell was sort of infused with the anxieties of the exile community and sort of the constant debates about how long the war would go on and beginning just before the under, underlying passage here. Um, it, you'll see, um, he writes, the future in America is hopeless. For you, as for me, there are only two possible courses, to go to France forever, which is what I am going to do, or to remain here and be psychoanalyzed. <laughs> and of course, Motherwell did not go to France and 
beginning a few years later, he entered psychoanalysis and would remain <laughs> in psychoanalysis until uh, his death. So um, I think I was reading this and it seemed like such an extreme statement, but you can just kind of see that it, it's, it's more like Motherwell reflecting back on, on you know, what, what uh, Andre Masson and Max Ernst, these other uh, artists in his circle at that point were, were trying to figure out what their future would be. Um, and this is just a small three by five postcard. Uh, and I had known this um, for years just from microfilm and the archives collection. So I was kind of stunned to see it uh, in person this summer. And um, even more surprised, I always thought it had been just a handwritten postcard, you know, sent to Baziotis to um, invite him to, mother, to Motherwell's first show, which was that Art of the Century, Peggy Guggenheim's gallery. But it's actually a a printed, um, probably lithography, a printed postcard with this uh, interesting turquoise ink. Uh, and this is the sort of very fragile uh, poster of Motherwell's first exhibition at Peggy Guggenheim with an essay by James Johnson Sweeney. It's on a very acidic paper, so, um, but it's one of the few copies that survives. Now, um, shortly after Motherwell's uh, show with uh, Art of the Century, he met um, Samuel Coutts, who was a writer, uh, an art historian, a novelist, and a playwright, and who wanted to open a gallery. So he's just writing Baziotis uh, that Coutts might be willing to offer him a contract. And in 1945, they entered into a contract where they got a monthly stipend in exchange for all of their work. Um, and had to produce a certain number of paintings a year. And I think one of the, sort of just a general comment, I mean, I think uh, in the history of abstract expressionism, there's often a lot of focus on the conflicts um, between the artists and um, sort of the game of art history is played as sort of a competition to see who will come on top come out on top, you know, this year it's Pollock or next year it's de Kooning. Um, but the actual history is sort of much more complicated and it's really a story of the friendships between these artists and how they work together to build, um, to kind of build a community of resistance that was able to push their art into the public eye. And um, the kind of strong personalities um, and the fact that they were each reaching for their own individual expression, um, kind of, I think for Motherwell, it, it fortified him to be surrounded by the, these strong um, creative forces who were not, not competing, they were each searching for their own truth. So these are three um, small uh, pictures taken by, probably by Jackson Pollock um, in, And I think that, uh, that, I believe, is Lee Krasner. And Motherwell, of course, is uh, on the beach, um, fully dressed, um, <laughs> the pale Irishman, uh, Irish Scotsman. Um, and Motherwell actually helped uh, Krasner and Pollock, um, loaned them his his house for several months while he was teaching at Black Mountain College in 1945 and they were looking for property and, and they purchased their property in Springs just a few months later. And during this period they were, sort of since Motherwell arrived in New York, he and Pollock had been quite close and over time they grew apart. But I think there's sort of, um, you know, my comment before is I think there's somewhat of a, a hint that um, there was some great conflict between them, whereas I think in the normal course of people's busy lives, they just kind of drift apart and it's not, there's no, you know, there's no judgment <laughs> imposed on that. Um, this is another, just an envelope to Baziotis and the um, two kind of faces on the right, I believe the top one is about the closest to a real self-portrait of Motherwell, even though it's just a doodle. There's one other, early drawing that has a similar um, 
similar face on it. Um, you know, I don't know that it was meant to be, but my, my reading of it is, is as a self-portrait. Now, um, while Motherwell was a great champion of abstract expressionism, um, one of his closest, uh, I wouldn't say, it was a close friendship, but an unusual friendship, really like an a intellectual meeting of minds with Joseph Cornell, who um, he met through the Surrealists in the early 40s and would remain close with, um, very close during, during the 40s and 50s, and they stayed in regular touch, at least until the 70s. Um, so this is a handmade postcard by Motherwell. Uh, greetings from uh, Maria and Bob. Maria was Motherwell's first wife. And this is a letter from Maria with a small collage element. She and Cornell were very close. Co Cornell had a habit of uh, kind of falling into crushes or being enamored of beautiful women, ballerinas, um, actresses. And Maria had been a, an actress that appeared on Broadway. Um, and so they, they exchanged, there's several letters in the Daedalus Foundation archives from Cornell with similar collage elements attached. And so here's Motherwell with uh, Maria on the right um, at LaGuardia Airport heading to California. And then this is uh, the only fo photograph of Motherwell in bed uh, from Provincetown in 1942. And I think in a lot of cases, I think these some of these photos were um, maybe taken by Maria and then given to Cornell, who um, kept a whole Motherwell dossier. He kept, he kept uh, albums or dossiers on, on important uh, subjects, so um, famous French ballerinas. And Motherwell is one of the few contemporaries who he kept such a dossier on. Um, and this is Motherwell in uh, Amagansett, where uh, the previous letter from Basiotis is from, and there's not a lot of photos of Motherwell working or writing um, among the hundreds of photos of him. And uh, at first, that when I first glanced at this photograph, I thought he's, you know, it's interesting, he's using the wrong end of the pen, but it's actually an artist's pen with a nib on, on both ends, and you can, you can see he has a pack of Pall Malls and not the... <laughs> Not the Galois that everyone associates with his later work. Um, and this is probably my favorite, um, just sort of the essence of the archives. Uh, and Cornell is kind of the, per you know, that Joseph Cornell's papers are in the archives is, is a perfect meeting um, because Cornell was a pack rat who searched old bookstores and... Uh, you know, libraries for inspiration. And this is five pieces of silver foil. Um, and Cornell was visiting, would visit Motherwell in the Hamptons on weekends, uh, frequently in the 40s, take the train out. And uh, one morning he woke up and he saw Maria's cousin sitting in the sunlight on, an, on, a, on the old rug in the living room, listening to, um, I think it was the Mozart's Requiem. And he had this moment of inspiration that he wanted to, to capture, somehow take home the essence of that. So he got these pieces of silver foil and did a rubbing of the texture of Motherwell's carpet and uh, saved them in an envelope and labeled it. And there's, there's a whole series of writings and, and photographs that go along with this in Cornell's papers, but um, just an, as an actual trace of a place, you know, that um, 70 years later still, you can still read very lightly the texture of the rug, the knots of the rug. Um, this is a, just a, you know, four poems by Rambo, a gift to Cornell from Motherwell with a drawing of a chicken. Um, I think there's one other image. Mo birds were a, were a frequent um, kind of motif for Motherwell, just uh, as he'd look out his window, just to kind of, as, maybe as a warm-up exercise for drawing or something, but it's something, a subject he returns to over and over among the few kind of recognizable images. Um, and then this is an essay, uh, very interesting. It's a first draft um, 
of the essay that Motherwell wrote for Cornell's first museum show at the Walker Art Center. And um, Motherwell had sort of turned H.H. Uh, H. Arneson, the curator at the Walker, onto Cornell's work. And in Arneson invited Motherwell to write it, although it wasn't published because there wasn't funds, unfortunately. Um, And um, let's see. Let go back here. Yeah, on the lower, um, if you can read it. I'm, I'm unable to see my, my note here. There's <laughs> a note by Cornell responding to. Um, Motherwell, where he says, uh, on the bottom of the page on the right, he says, the past. Yes. Um, let me just bring this over here so I can see this. Uh, he says, the past, uh, like it not because it is old, but because it is good. <laughs> he sort of reflects on uh, Cornell's philosophy and kind of attachment to these older images. So throughout this, there's kind of annotations by Cornell in response to Motherwell's thoughts. Um, so while Cornell collected these very personal things, he also did a remarkable job of holding on to you know, Motherwell's announcements and various things that Motherwell would send him over the years. So this is a poster in 1948. Motherwell started a school in New York, the subjects of the artist, with uh, Mark Rothko, William Baziotis, and David Hare, and then joining them a few months later was Barnett Newman. Um, and this is just a, a newspaper ad that Cornell clipped out for subjects of the artist, a new kind of art school. And then this, at the subjects of the artist, they would uh, hold Friday night talks um, one of the artists, there were supposed to be five artists, and when Clifford still dropped out to take a better paying job in California, they had an empty day, so they started Friday evening talks, and it was one of the few um, sort of original records of that that I've been able to find in any archive, uh, listing talks by Jean Arp, Willem de Kooning, Fritz Glarner, and a program of films. Um, Cornell was a great collector of, of early cinema and um, would frequently do um, not quite performances, but like these very carefully curated uh, presentations of these early films. Uh, just after the, um, starting the school, Motherwell, um, sort of in the late 40s, he was, you know, the, the New York artists were becoming better known. There were, um, Beginning, this is one of the first shows, really, of the group outside of New York. It was in uh, 1951 uh, at Frank Pearl's gallery. And um, sort of at the last minute, just before Christmas, Pearls wrote to Motherwell saying that he thought he needed some sort of statement to explain the work. He had received the work, and he thought that his clients or the public in California wasn't going to understand it. So Motherwell, um, in the next week, um, put together this talk and uh, there's, I think it's a three page draft of the essays and the, the files of um, the Pearls Gallery. And then this is the printed version of Motherwell's essay on the right. There's some interesting handwritten uh, changes to the essay. Uh, now this is um, an installation view of black and white an exhibition held at Motherwell's uh, gallery, the Coots Gallery, um, in 1950. And Motherwell wrote the catalog essay. And on the left is uh, Willem de Kooning's Dark Pond. In the middle, Motherwell's Granada. And on the right, uh, Hans Hoffmann's Germania II. Um, and this is one of the first times Motherwell showed a work in his Elegy to the Spanish Republic series. Um, so Motherwell really believed in sort of the idea of modernism, uh, 
not only as a direction for his own art, but as kind of a way of thinking about the world. And he was a real champion um, sort of of modernism in all its forms and became a frequent teacher, lecturer, and writer. And this is him uh, teaching in 1945 at Black Mountain College. And then in 1951, he returned to Black Mountain and met um, Robert Rauschenberg and Cy Twombly, who were his students, although Motherwell says he basically didn't do any teaching. He, you know, he was, seemed to be more in the role of just encouraging their, their good instincts, but um, he was really taken with Twombly's work and recommended that the Coots Gallery give him a show, which they did in December, and Motherwell wrote this essay uh, for a show Twombly had in Chicago in October of 1951. Um, it was just a series of uh, Motherwell's own exhibition catalogs from various collections. This is uh, 1947. Um, and this is a famous, uh, often quoted statement um, that Motherwell wrote for this April 1947 show. He says, I begin a painting with a series of crimes. Um, the painting comes out of the correction of mistakes by feeling. And goes on. Uh, this is the 1948 solo exhibition. It's a 1949 collage. Shows the first, uh, his mother was actually going through his divorce to his first wife. And so in lieu of a show of new work, they put on the first exhibition devoted solely to his collages. Um, and there's a... Uh, statement by Marion Moore, the poet on the poster, but um, so it was kind of the first time Motherwell was really singled out and um, the show was very well reviewed. There was a, a show of collage at the Museum of Modern Art um, right around this time too. So it was kind of the beginning of collage really taking off and then in, in the 50s with Ellsworth Kelly and Rauschenberg um, it gains much more prominence. But during the 40s, Motherwell was one of the, the main practitioners in America. Uh, it's just a, his 1950 solo show. This is the first uh, time he showed a large group of the elegies to the Spanish Republic, uh, along with several different series um, at the Coots Gallery. And um, at this time, it was elegies with to the Spanish Republic in parentheses, and the paintings were just named after Spanish cities. It hadn't become the name of individual paintings yet. Uh, this is, uh, the Coots Gallery kept very um, careful scrapbooks of every exhibition. So there was a, a large scrapbook for every year the gallery was open month by month, all the reviews and all the press and catalogs of every artist. So there's a, you know, 20 volumes or something in the, in the archives, which are very, you know, some of them are very fragile, but they're, they're pretty remarkable um, resource. And here's another bird, uh, chicken drawing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the show for that last catalog, 1952, at the Coots Gallery on Madison Avenue. Um, in 1958, uh, we don't have any photos of his second wife uh, and the mother of his children here, but in 1958, he married for the third time to the artist Helen Frankenthaler. So this is April 1958, a photo by Hans Namath. Um, another Namath photo, Motherwell in his uh, basement studio uh, on 94th Street, where it's his primary studio in the 1950s. Um, the basement with uh, built out a little bit, so there's a small skylight, and uh, he could walk out into the garden of the house. But so the painting um, he has his back turned to here is an early state of this canvas, the wedding, which was completed right before his marriage to Frankenthaler, and the form that you see in the image on the left, um, you can just barely make out in the black 
area to the right, so Motherwell had flipped the canvas. Um, and for anyone who thinks the uh, abstract expressionists never agreed on anything, there's this uh, letter from the Bernard Rice papers. Rice was a collector and an accountant who had kept the books for Peggy Guggenheim, and this is authorizing uh, Rice to um, oversee negotiations with Sidney Janus Gallery, and it's uh, signed by Motherwell, Philip Guston, Mark Rothko, Franz Klein, and de Kooning. Sort of a autograph collector's dream document. Um, so for some reason, I think mainly because, and maybe some of the galleries, uh, Motherwell worked with Marlboro Gallery in the 60s, and Marlboro is still an ongoing entity. Um, there's not as much um, material for the 60s and 70s, or not as much visually interesting material. There's some gallery records, um, some correspondence, and a lot of interviews, actually, from, from the period. But um, sort of in the show, sort of skips ahead. So this is 1971, and uh, a portrait by Renata Ponsold, who would become his fourth wife. Um, a sort of a wife per decade until he met Renata, who was with him. Um, and I'm not gonna, not gonna read uh, much from this, but I'll just point out in the, you can see in the exhibition, it's a very interesting um, relationship in Motherwell's last uh, decade of life. Um, he had a retrospective at the Albright Knox that traveled around the country. And when it came to the Guggenheim in 1985, Arthur Danto uh, reviewed the show for the nation. And um, Motherwell was very taken with, with Danto's words, that it was the first time he felt that a critic had had truly understood what he was about. Um, and they have, we have the first, um, the letter to Danto and, and back to Motherwell in the show. And it's, it's, it's both, um, these initial letters are both very admiring, but also they, they begin to get into sort of a philosophical debate. It's kind of, um, it's this very interesting exchange from the philosopher who wrote about art to the uh, artist who had studied philosophy as a young man. Um, and during the last decade, I mean, it was a very pro professional relationship. They would see each other for dinner, um, or Danto would come to Motherwell's studio. But um, I think intellectually, it was, you know, it was a nice, um, nice to find sort of a like mind at that stage in his career. Uh, this is Motherwell in the spring of 1991 um, in his Greenwich, Connecticut studio. And that July, he would uh, go out to Provincetown uh, where he kept a summer home for 30 years and uh, passed away suddenly in uh, that July. But he had been working um, right up to the very end. Um, sort of with remarkable vigor. So uh, <clears throat> this is um, just a newspaper account of, and a photograph of his memorial service, which uh, was held on the beach behind his home in Provincetown. And then um, it's kind of a, this is a very nice poem. Bud Hopkins was an artist who actually had made the decision to become an artist. He'd been studying art history at Oberlin and heard Motherwell give a week-long seminar in 1951. And um, Motherwell's, the papers from Motherwell's seminar as well as all the student responses to it are in the collection of William Seitz. Um, so you can actually read Hopkins' reaction to, to Motherwell as, as an 18-year-old. Um, but they were friends and uh, worked together in the Long Point Gallery in Provincetown, uh, an artist co-op that Motherwell uh, was involved in. And this is a poem written by Hopkins um, on the day of Motherwell's death, just called 4RM on hearing of his death. And the final two stanzas 
said, all artists are monsters. He once said to me, uh, with a saddened shrug, it's true, I know. I gotta, I gotta move over here. My, my notes aren't working today. Um, he had those selfish moments, as do you and I, and yet now, in death, something floats above it all. A deep and caring love, perhaps inadequately expressed. Another problem known to you and me. We will miss him more, the more we come to see that loss, or that love. And all of this before his art, which brings the saddest thought. We have seen all the mother wells there will ever be. Um, so and that's where the show closes. Um, and I don't want to go too much into it, but I'll be available to talk in the question and answer session. So um, the next speaker is uh, Jennifer Cohen. And are you gonna, are you gonna?